Let's talk about latency and specifically how to get the latency in Tezos down to a negligible amount. But first, what are we talking about? And if I say, oh, this blockchain is super fast, am I talking about latency or throughput? Different concepts. Throughput is your broad processing power. It's how many transactions per second you are able to uh, process. Latency is how long it takes between the moment a user creates a transaction to the moment that transaction is included in a chain. To take a car analogy, if you have a car factory, it could be that your car factory is producing a car every 10 minutes, but it still takes a few days to assemble the car. And that's because there's a whole pipeline inside of the factory um, that processes uh, many cars at once. So as always in blockchains, you have to think about um, the security and the design of it. And the reason why you do not have infinite throughputs and uh, infinitely low latency in the systems uh, is to maintain security properties. So I find it useful um, to talk about Bitcoin because it's the original blockchain and it, um, it gives us a good intuition as to what are the constraints are. So in Bitcoin, the latency is about 10 minutes. That's for one confirmation and that's in expectation. It could be more, it could be less because the mining process is random. If you want six confirmations for a higher odds that the transaction is going to stick, this is going to take uh, an hour on expectation. And the throughput is around four transactions per second. Now, if you wanted uh, in a system like this to increase throughput, you could say, I'm going to increase a block size. But there's challenges that come with that. And the challenge is a higher processing requirement that's now um, demanded out, out of all miners or all validators of the chain. If you want to decrease the latency, you could say, I'm going to decrease the block time. Now, decreasing the block time does not mean necessarily that you increase the throughput, right? Your blocks could be half the size and come at twice the frequency. What's the trade-off here? Why exactly can't the block times be one second or two seconds? Well, to understand that, you have to look at the fact that uh, Nakamoto consensus, so typical proof of work consensus, is a synchronous algorithm. It assumes that there's a guarantee that messages get delivered in a network under a certain amount of time. And that time is not 10 minutes. It assumes that messages get delivered in a time that's small compared to 10 minutes. Indeed, you want miners to be able to be informed right away that a new block has been created so they can start building on that block. If I am a malicious actor and I have control of network delays, I could come in that network and I could delay blocks so that the block of a particular miner um, have an advantage. If you do that, you can attack the safety of the protocol. And so in order to, um, to prevent that, Bitcoin has a choice of a very long block time. 10 minutes is conservative. It assumes, look, it's very likely that the blocks are going to propagate in less than 10 minutes over the network. Even if I'm connecting over Tor, even if there's some disruptions, it's going to work. And even if it doesn't, even if somehow someone is attacking the network, the chain might continue, but I might be on my guard. I might be looking out for reorganization because I noticed that all of a sudden the hash rates dropped. The fact that the hash rates doesn't um, adjust too dynamically in Bitcoin is precisely so that you can detect this type of attacks. So that's one way to do it, but it requires uh, a fairly long block time. Ethereum, which uses a similar uh, proof of work algorithm, has made the choice of a much smaller uh, block time, but they use an on-call mechanism to try to alleviate some of the problems that come with um, uh, network disruptions. But how do we get even shorter block times? Well, for that, you have to move to um, non-synchronous algorithms. No, not necessarily fully all the way to asynchronous, but sometimes something called semi-synchronous or pseudo-synchronous. And the idea of these algorithms is to imagine that the network may be disrupted. Maybe someone is attacking the network. But at some point, the attacks will stop and the blocks will be able to repropagate it under a certain time. That's the assumption that's made by those, uh, by those algorithms, which is fairly, fairly reasonable. And once you make those assumptions, you can afford to have much smaller block times because you no longer have a trade-off between having very short block times and the security of your system. Now, the way this consensus algorithm work is much closer to classical Byzantine fault tolerance algorithms. And as a result, they involve some form of finality because how can you safely go quickly? You can safely go quickly if you have all the participants, all the validators, or a very large statistically significant sample 
of the validators come in and say, yep, yep, we've seen the block, it's all right. Now, if you have this information, there's no reason why you can't proceed very quickly. If you don't have it, if all of a sudden it looks like, well, you know, I only have a fraction of the validators here, you wait, you don't produce blocks. And it's a little similar to what I was describing earlier. You know, in Bitcoin, if you were noticing a drop in the hash rate, you would say, ha, huh, something, something's off. You know, there's some participants are not present in the system. So it's, a, it's, it's the same idea, except that it's formalized at the level of the consensus algorithm. And oftentimes people talk about finality and they imagine that, oh, the, the benefit of finality is that you're sure that the block is, is final. It's not going to change, no reorg. That's not really the main value of it because the difference between being certain and being 99.999% sure from a user's perspective is not really meaningful. Now, what's really interesting with these algorithms is that they let you go very, very fast. You can have very short block time. And if you're wrong, if, if you've made unrealistic assumptions about the network, it doesn't matter. You know, the network will slow down um, to accommodate the pace at which it can actually go. In fact, some algorithms go even further. They are um, they have a property called uh, being responsive and they go as fast as the network will allow them to go. You don't even have to program a minimum block time. They will just make the blocks as fast as possible. So are there trade-offs here? You know, if there's no security issues with that, can we just set the block time to 0 0.0001 second? Well, no, not so fast. So if you look at the responsive algorithms, uh, the algorithm, the consensus algorithm that Libra uh, wanted to put out uh, was responsive. And it sounds like a great property. And it is if you have a centralized system, but in the decentralized system, it, be it becomes a problem. Because you see in a decentralized system, it's possible for some nodes to be offline some of the time to leave and join um, the network. And you want to be able to reward people from being live and notice when people are not being live. But if you're making your blocks as fast as possible, whoever happens to be the slowest in your network, and it doesn't have to, they don't have to be slow in absolute terms, maybe they could be very fast, they just happen to be the one third of your validator, which is the slowest. Well, they're never going to be included in blocks because blocks will say, oh, I have two thirds of my network, I can proceed. You proceed very, very fast. So if I have a validator I'm a little further from the rest of the network, I get dropped. And then we now have a smaller pool of validator and then one third gets dropped and then one third gets dropped until you end up with a single person in a single data center. So that doesn't work very well. So even though we don't have this uh, safety of the consensus aspect that uh, requires conservative block times, you still want to set a non-zero block time for the simple reason that you want to guarantee that people can participate. You want to say, look, if you can get your block in less than three seconds inside the network. Regardless of where you are on Earth, you can be in the group, right? So you set this minimum, and this is a more of a political decision. You have to choose, do we want to allow people running nodes on Tor uh, who are gonna have worse latency? Do you want to allow people who are not in data centers? Do you want to allow people who are connect by satellite? These are political decision at the level of a, uh, of a, of a network. And those are not necessarily driven by technical concerns. They're driven by decentralization concerns. But of course, on the other hand, you have user experience, which is pushing. User experience wants to have very short blocks so that if I interact with a DAP, I can get an instant confirmation that my transaction is going to proceed. So how do we reconcile the two? So first of all, the current block time in Tezos is around 30 seconds. But because it's regular every 30 seconds, it means the expected time for a transaction to be included is about 15 seconds, which is similar to, uh, to Ethereum. Now, that can, seem a, that can seem to be a puzzle, but it's a property of Poisson process. As if you understand it, explain in a comment. It's a really cool uh, statistical puzzle. But 15 seconds is still a little slow, I think. We can make it shorter without penalizing uh, participants in the network. It's not currently the main focus of most of the core development happening, uh, because I think throughput is the bigger issue right now and uh, the most important one that's facing the blockchain ecosystem. But throughput is definitely on the list. Uh, sorry, but latency is definitely on the list uh, and getting that latency down to, I think, a few seconds is a sweet spot in terms of having a really good user experience without sacrificing decentralization while allowing people to participate on smaller devices anywhere in the world. But how can we get better than that? Could, could we still cut the latency without sacrificing this decentralization? And it turns out that, yes, there's one way to do it. And it's fairly straightforward, but 
in a system like Tezos, you know who the next block producer is going to be. And it's funny because for a while, it, this was something that was hotly debated uh, in the proof of stake space. There was this idea that, oh, if you don't, if you know who the next leader is, it's terrible because you can lead us, um, this person. And so you need to have this uh, hidden uh, leader uh, uh, property. And that's mostly what drove the design for, for Algorand. It turns out that it's not really, uh, it hasn't really been an issue. And primarily because, you know, a, a producer, a block producer is not an IP address. A block producer is a, is a, uh, is a cryptographic address. They could be injecting from many different IPs from many different places. So there's a lot of mitigations that exist that mean it's not really a huge, uh, uh, huge concern. However, it gives you a really, really big benefit. If you know who the next block producer is going to be and you want to inject a transaction, you can go directly to that block producer. You can say, here's my transaction. Can you sign a receipt saying that, yes, it will be included in the next block? So you can do that, and on top of that, um, by reflecting on the chain, by looking at what transactions were included in the chain, you could have a system where someone guarantees they're gonna include your transaction, and if they don't, they can pay uh, a penalty, and you can prove that all cryptographically. Now, a user would never really have to do any of this, they would just interact with the app normally, but behind the scene, you have a system that gives them confirmation and ensures essentially the uh, the transaction against uh, uh, not being included. It doesn't work 100% because maybe that validator goes offline right at that moment and it ends up being another validator. But it is a very neat solution which gives you latencies way be, you know, we're talking below 400 millisecond, below 100 millisecond. It's really directly how long it takes you to talk to the leader of the next round. And that's probably the shortest latency you can possibly have. So in conclusion, Right now, the main focus for core development on Tezos has been primarily around throughput. But latency is definitely next in the list. Getting latency down to a few seconds, I think, is a good thing to do. And it's a way to have really good UX while still preserving the decentralization of the network, which is important. You know, These networks are only meaningful insofar as they're really decentralized. And the third thing is to go beyond a second as a, rather than putting additional requirements on block producers, I think having mechanisms where you can contact the next leader and include your transaction is a, a great way to go. Thank you for listening. Uh, please don't forget to click like and subscribe. And let me know what you think about latency in the comments.